But I thanked everybody for coming and the guest keys again. And uh, we talked about the, the gravity and the dark and matter and dark energy. Now, this is what Bob will be talking about. But if he if he if he decides not to and he starts talking about gardening or you know home improvement, I told him that we're a really sophisticated audience and we wouldn't let him get away with that question period. So. After, uh, after Bob's talk, there will be questions, and also there'll be, uh, Bob will be signing books at the back. I'd say in the back of the room, but it's actually a little boat back there that he'll be signing books at, and you want to see the boat if, for no other reason than it's a really cool thing. Now, this is the um, time in the introduction when I'm supposed to give the bi a little bit of a biography of Bob, but you know I'm not gonna do that um, tonight. I, 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 I will say, briefly that he grew up in the Boston area and he attended college at that, uh, that uh, small com uh, commuter school that somewhere north around Boston starts with an H. And after his uh, time there, he went out to the West Coast and got his PhD in astronomy at another obscure uh, place called Caltech. Um, but enough about Bob, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, actually, I'm not entirely kidding. But I, I do want to talk about is a little bit of my, my experience uh, being uh, in an audience that, uh, where Bob was speaking. I first met him um, a year and a half ago at a Renaissance weekend in Santa Monica. And Bob was um, one of the key speakers uh, at the conference. And, you know, I'm a corporate lawyer. I know nothing about any of this stuff. Um, I know pretty much nothing about corporate law either, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, but I was enthralled by uh, Bob's talk about uh, the expanding and accelerating universe. I think like all of us, we've looked out in the, in the night sky and seen all of these stars and the Milky Way and get a little bit of a sense of that was uh, pretty impressive to me. Um, my first thought was uh, to uh, see if Bob would be willing to adopt me. <laughs> and then, then I thought that sounded kind of weird, um, because mainly I'm older than he is. And then I realized it was probably really weird because he probably gets people asking him to adopt them all the time. So I decided that that was not uh, uh, something to do. And then I thought, well, maybe because I was on the board of the Athenaeum and connected with this wonderful lecture series, I'd invite him to speak. And that's what I did. And I was very, very pleased that he accepted a year and a half ago. I've been looking forward to this night for a long time, and I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Bob Kirk. Thank you for this talk on corporate law, which I'll be giving. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do tonight, if I possibly can, is to tell you the 13.7 billion year history of the universe in 40 minutes. And to do that, I have to leave out a lot of details. I have to leave out things that are traditional to be included in history, things like kings or wars or earth. Uh, and uh, I also have to leave out uh, references to most of my um, colleagues because I found that that's a way to really compress the talk, is not to give credit to anyone else. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the expanding universe, and I'm going to talk about the fact that the universe is accelerating. And I'll explain what that means. This picture gives you some idea of what the subject is. I'm going to be talking about galaxies. So you see that big, beautiful spiral galaxy, which is made up of about 100 billion stars. And then there's some dust there that uh, no one has cleaned up that uh, is absorbing some of the light. And then down in the lower left, there's a single star, which is a supernova, a star that is exploding, and for a little while, about a month, glowing as brightly as four billion stars like the sun. And it turns out that those supernovae are very useful tools for judging the distances to galaxies and for measuring the history of cosmic expansion. And it's by looking at supernovae, near and far, that we've been able to trace out the history of cosmic expansion and to see that the universe was expanding, uh, uh, that the universe was decelerating, slowing down at first, 
and then that this changed into an acceleration about five billion years ago, about the time the Earth was formed, and that since that time the universe has been expanding faster and faster. This is an extraordinary idea, uh, and it involves these beautiful objects, the galaxies and the supernovae, and so I'll be trying to put these beautiful ideas and these beautiful images together for you tonight. But I thought, since I came, you know, here it's Nantucket, and this is the place where the Mariah Mitchell Observatory is, and Mariah Mitchell, in the middle of the 1800s, was a person who used astronomical instruments to great effect. She found a comet in, in uh, 1847 from the roof of the Pacific Bank building from which, at which her father was the cashier. I guess that let you get in late at night. I don't know. Anyway, uh, and I thought I'd just say a word about the development of technology and a little bit about women in science that are related to Mariah Mitchell because, after all, we're here. So it turns out comets were a big topic in astronomy in the 1800s. In 1842, there was a dramatic comet that everyone could see that was a brilliant thing and that was seen in Boston, and the people of Boston came to the little college in Cambridge and said, where's the telescope? How could we see this comet? And it turned out that Harvard did not have a research telescope, and that was 1842. By 1843, they had built the world's largest telescope, shown here. Uh, and there's a plaque of the donors on the wall over there, which includes John Quincy Adams and other uh, uh, Harvard and uh, Boston notables. Anyway, they uh, raised enough money in six months to build the world's largest telescope. I'll come to the end when I'll talk about building the world's largest telescope now. And if any of you want to be on the plaque that goes up there, see me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that the development of astronomy is in a lot of ways the development of technology. The ability to collect light and measure light is an important thing. So here I show you the first uh, image which was recorded on photographic, uh, 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 by photographic technique. This is a daguerreotype of the moon which was taken at Harvard in 1852. And that was the first time that people had used a telescope instead of uh, putting the light into your eye as Mariah Mitchell did in 1847 when she found her comet on October 1st. See, I read the website. Uh, the, uh, 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 the way to do this uh, very soon after was to photograph the sky. And of course, a photograph is something that can be examined later, that provides a permanent record, and also it can be a time exposure where you leave the shutter open uh, for a long period of time. And so these first emulsions were very slow, these uh, daguerreotypes are very slow, it took a lot of light to make an image. Uh, and something that's also connected with Mariah Mitchell is that she was one of the first, as far as I know, professional astronomer who was a woman. And uh, when she went to Vassar, she became a kind of influential person and set a number of people on the path to becoming astronomer, including some of these women, I think, who were uh, called the computers. That was the name for the job of computing. Uh, at Harvard anyway, uh, they were called the computers. And uh, these women, shown here in this kind of stagey photograph, uh, were um, important in advancing science, especially at Harvard, especially in the late years of the 19th century and into the 20th century. And they're shown here uh, in this rather cramped room, everybody wearing these long silk dresses and so on, working. The origin of that was that the um, observatory director had a man as his, an assistant, as his assistant, and uh, who was kind of an incompetent guy. And one day he got mad at him. And he said, you know, he said, my housekeeper could do a better job than you. And uh, then he thought, I'll hire my housekeeper. And so he did. His housekeeper became the head of these women who worked as uh, astronomers at Harvard. And so was it exploitation? Sure, they were being paid 25 cents an hour, but the observatory director was only being paid $2 an hour, so, you know, figure it out. And, uh, but they had the opportunity, and they had the opportunity to really do scientific work and to publish work under their own names. 
One of the most famous of them is Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who discovered there was a certain kind of star uh, which was identifiable by its variations. It got brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, but if you measured the length of time, the period that it took to get bright and dim, you could tell how bright it really was, whether it was an extraordinarily bright star or a dim one, by measuring something that didn't depend on the distance. And she said, kind of diffidently, you know, it's worthy of notice that the brighter variables have the longer periods. And this became the key to opening up the size of the universe and the history of cosmic expansion that I'm going to explain tonight. Harla Shapley, who was the observatory director and took a lot of the credit for Henrietta Leavitt's work, used Leavitt's variable stars to measure the Milky Way, the system that the Sun is in, to see how big it was. If you knew how bright the star was from its variability, then you could figure out how far away it was from its apparent brightness. And he was able to show that the Milky Way is really big compared to the solar system and that we, despite our sense of importance, are not at the center of the Milky Way. So here I show you a picture. This is not the Milky Way, <laughs> but it shows that you are not at the center of, I mean, not you, but Nantucket is not at the center of the universe. The Earth is around the Sun. The Sun is a citizen of the Milky Way galaxy, 100 billion stars, and we're not anywhere near the center. We're somewhere out in the edge. Now, what Shapley was able to do with those stars that Henrietta Leavitt had measured was to see how big the Milky Way was. So you know that the speed of light is a poet's metaphor for really fast. And, uh, but what is the speed of light? The speed of light is a foot, a foot, that's a unit of distance that's used here and in Myanmar, uh, a foot in a nanosecond, in a billionth of a second. So light travels from here to there. And so when you see the world, you don't see the world as it is. You see the world as it was when the light bounced off the things that you're seeing. So I'm looking at the people in the front here. They are 10 nanoseconds away. And curiously, don't be insulted, the people in the back seem younger. <laughs> because I see them as they were 100 nanoseconds ago. OK, just a humorous remark in this room, but in astronomy and in the scale of the universe, it's not just a joke. It means that we get to see what the universe was like in the past by looking at distant objects. So the time it takes light to travel across the Milky Way is about 100,000 years. Uh, and uh, Shapley thought that that was big enough that it constituted uh, the universe. But that's not, that's not quite true, it t as I'll show you in a second. Uh, so here's the Milky Way. This is an image. Last night, we had the chance to go out and see the Milky Way. Nice and dark here in Nantucket, I must say. People have been shooting out the streetlights with 22s or something. I don't know. Anyway, very good. Congratulations. Because uh, uh, you can see the Milky Way. This is a composite showing photographs from the northern hemisphere, where we are, and from the southern hemisphere. No one ever sees the whole Milky Way uh, like this, because the Earth gets in the way, but never mind that. And here's a picture of the Milky Way. In 1917, and I'll show you why that's an important date, that's when Einstein started to work on this problem, people thought that the Milky Way was the universe, that the stars in the Milky Way, that they were the things that constituted the universe. And if you look at this picture, well, it looks like that's the most important thing in the picture. But over here is a little thing, one of the nebulae, the little fuzzy things, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, is equivalent to the Milky Way and that this change in the picture from our galaxy being the universe to our galaxy being just one citizen in a universe that's much larger took place after 1917. Okay, so uh, I alluded already to Einstein. A speaker is always wise to ally himself with really good people. <laughs> Albert, 
Einstein, really good. Okay, so here he is. And this is a photograph, and again, I wanted to emphasize the technology. If you look at this, you see a nice picture of Einstein, but you see the guy behind him, sorry, shaking his head, no. And the person who was sitting in the chair next to him in the foreground got up and left during the time the shutter was open. There are two things here. One is nobody wants to be between the camera and Einstein. The other is that uh, the shutter was open a long time because this was a photograph taken with the process of chemistry on silver that was the way everybody, including astronomers, detected light back then, and I'll come back to that. Okay, Not a, now the new thing is that we're able to see what people were thinking in those days. And here what you can see is that Einstein was thinking the universe, by which people meant the Milky Way, must be static. That means not expanding or contracting. And in fact, it's true that the stars of the Milky Way are not systematically moving apart or moving together, and astronomers had told Einstein that. So he thought, well, all right, if the Milky Way is the universe and the stars are not expanding or contracting, and I have invented general relativity, oh, I forgot that part, if I have in invented general relativity, which is the theory of gravity, I have to think of a way to make a universe that is static and obeys these new rules of gravity, which I've just invented, which he did. And he did it by putting in an extra term. He kind of cheated. He put in a term which was allowed by the theory but not required by it, which he called the cosmological term. And he put it in, as he said, to arrive at this conclusion, we admittedly had to introduce an extent. Can you read this from the back? Because it's in German. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We admittedly had to introduce an extension of the field equations which is not justified by our actual knowledge of gravitation. It's to be emphasized, however, blah, blah, blah. This term is necessary only for the purpose of making possible a quasi-static static, distribution of matter as required by the fact of the small velocities of the stars. So in other words, Einstein stuck in by hand afterwards this cosmological constant, usually denoted by the Greek letter lambda, to make the universe static, to agree with the astronomical observations of the day. The thing that changed was the astronomical observations. You know, in this field, we're always confident, but rarely correct. <laughs> and how did that happen? It happened by technology. It happened by the invention or the construction of a bigger and better telescope. So this is the great telescope of the day, uh, just after World War I. This is the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. It's built with the technology that might characterize the Titanic. But unlike the Titanic, it kept its distance from icebergs. And it's up there on Mount Wilson to this day. The thing that has changed, of course, is that the little village of Los Angeles which had 25,000 people uh, when this was built, has, is now emitting a lot of light and making this not such a great astronomical sight. Anyway, here it is, the 100-inch telescope, the mirror. It's down here, 100 inches across, a little over 8 feet. And the observer would sit up on this bentwood chair and uh, control the telescope uh, through the night. And even though it's California, it's a mountaintop and it's not warm. Uh, so uh, here is, oh, sorry. So I was supposed to show you the most important thing is the place where the observer would sit. Just like the most important thing in that other picture uh, was the, not the big object, um, but the thing off to the side. And so here's a picture of Edwin Hubble, who was an astronomer working at the Mount Wilson Observatories, who showed that the Milky Way was not the whole universe, that the universe was a much bigger place and that we live in a universe of galaxies, each of which is equivalent to the one that we live in. So instead of thinking that we lived in the universe, we live in a part of the universe that is the Milky Way galaxy. And the way he did that was by using these photographic plates. Here's one taken in 1923, where you can see there's some markings on it. Don't worry, the markings are on the back side, which is the glass side of the plate, and he wrote uh, the date, 6th of November, 
And then there's that star up at the top right where he thought it was N, a nova, a new star that appeared. And then he said, no, it's a variable star. And it turned out it was one of those variable